Uh, so I'm here to tell you about my journey from evil to heroism. Um, and it's an interesting journey. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, I think we're missing some of my slides. Oh, sh Anyway, I grew up in poverty in New York City ghetto. Uh, and as Bill Strickland said yesterday to all of us, if you grew up in a ghetto, you grew up without nature. You grew up in an ugly place. And the problem is, how do you keep that ugliness from getting inside of you? But I also had friends who were good kids who did bad things. And I always wondered, what went wrong? Why did they, do, why did they go bad? And so the question I asked as a kid, is the line between good and evil impermeable? As my parents had led me to believe that good people like us were on this side and bad people like them were on the other side. Or was it permeable that good kids could be corrupted, seduced, and at the same time, bad kids could be recovered? Uh, and so that has guided my thinking since then. And now that I'm a psychologist, I'm interested in evil. I'm interested in understanding evil. I'm interested in uh, uh, creating evil so I, I understand how and why. And there are really three kinds of evil. One kind of evil is dispositional. This is in people. What do people bring into a situation? And we call these bad apples. Andres Brevik is a no young, handsome Norwegian guy who shot to death 69 kids, uh, thinking he was a martyr for trying to prevent uh, uh, Norway from becoming a Muslim uh, enclave. Then there's situational evil, which is the main thing I'm going to talk about. Situational evil is the barrel, the bad barrel that you put good apples in and they get corrupted. Uh, this was the case we'll talk about in a moment with Abu Ghraib. So this is the social and physical environment in which you put people in and it's that setting, the things all around us that are corruptible. The third part of evil is the more powerful one. It's the one we ignore. It's what we call systemic evil. It's the bad barrel makers. This is where power is. This is cultural, historical, legal, economic. And that produces the big evil, although it's very effectively, typically disguised. So evil, my definition is, evil is about power and it's about the abuse of power. To intentionally harm people through prejudice, uh, through gossip, through discrimination, uh, to hurt people physically through torture, through rape, to kill mortally. But again, big evil is done by governments. Uh, in wars, and this is to commit crimes against humanity. Stanley Milgram, little Jewish kid in the Bronx, asked the question, could the Holocaust occur again in America? Because he wanted to know, could he be put in a concentration camp? He asked, would you electrocute a stranger if somebody like Hitler asked you to? We were high school classmates in, in, in the Bronx, uh, and we b were both what we call situationists. We believed that if the situation were changed, the things we saw around us, if your father wasn't working, this kid's sister was a prostitute, things would be different. If you grow up privileged, you want to believe that goodness is in your genes and that you don't want things to change because you want to maintain that privilege. So he did a very famous study, uh, which I will encapsulate for you very briefly. Uh, he did it in New Haven, Connecticut. He was a Yale professor. And he also replicated it in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And it's a study about memory. So he invites people to come to his laboratory, two at a time, and one of you is going to be the learner, and one of you is going to be the teacher. And the learner uh, gives, the teacher gives the learner material to learn. When he gets it right, you say, fine. But when he gets it wrong, you have to punish him by giving an electric shock. And so here's uh, the, the teacher, and here's uh, the uh, experiment in the lab coat. And when he gets it wrong, you press a button. The first button is 15 volts. When you press it, there's no response. The, the guy you're teaching is in another room. And as you increase from 15 to 30 to 45, each increment is only 15 volts. So it's a really very small, steadily uh, slippery slope down. But now when it gets in the hundreds, the guy starts screaming and yelling, and you're a good person. You turn the experiment and say, sir, uh, I don't want to continue. He said, I'm sorry, you have a contract. You must go on. And the study now is about not knowing how to exit. Because now the guy is really screaming, and the experiment says, it doesn't matter. He's got a contract too. You must continue. The problem now is, at the end of this shock box is 450 volts. When it gets to 375, the guy screams, there's a thud and silence. He's either unconscious or he's dead, in which case you can't help him improve his memory anymore, so probably everybody should quit. So the question is, who would go up to 450 volts? 
Milgram described the study to 40 psychiatrists in New Haven, and they said 1%. That's sadistic behavior, only sadists would do that. Well, it turns out they were wrong. Maybe it was more, maybe it was 2%, maybe it was 5%, uh, maybe it was 10%, maybe it was a third, maybe it was half. In fact, in that research, and in many, many replications, it turns out two-thirds of all ordinary people, and Milgram tested 1,000 men be ages 20 to 50, and it included one group of women, two-thirds go all the way in that situation. So yes, indeed, if Hitler asked you to electrocute a stranger, he could get the majority of people in virtually any audience to do so. My message is, all evil begins with 15 volts. All evil begins the Friday night when you're going home and somebody says, hey, the numbers are not adding up. Would you warm up the books? That's a prelude to cooking the books. All evil begins with a little gossip, a little putting somebody down, a little uh, laughing at somebody's racist, sexist joke. Because once you do that, you're on that slippery slope down. My sense is that it's very rare that somebody will tell you to do a bad thing. We grow up in institutions, in families, in schools. Uh, we grow up in uh, teams, uh, businesses. So what happens when institutions have the, uh, that we are enmeshed in an institution? Now you have roles. There are rules. There are group, group pressures. Uh, there are leaders. There's a whole set of complex factors that impact your behavior. So I did a study at Stanford University 40 years ago. We put an ad in the Palo Alto newspaper. We got 75 volunteers. And we gave them a battery of personality tests and interviews because we wanted two dozen who were the most normal and most healthy. Okay? Good apples. We flip a coin, half are guards, half are prisoners. And then we assign half to be guards and half to be prisoners. The prisoners are put in these degrading little outfits. We take away their names. They become numbers. They are de-individuated. The guards are put in, have handsome uniforms with symbols of power, silver reflecting sunglasses, an idea I got from the movie Cool Hand Luke, to promote the dehumanization in contact between prisoners and guards. And it begins with jumping jacks, menial things, push-ups, but it always goes down that slippery slope to more and more humiliating, degrading activities, cleaning toilet bowls out with their bare hands, stripping them naked, uh, using every occasion to humiliate them uh, more and more. Within 36 hours, a student we chose because he was normal and healthy had an emotional breakdown. Okay. We had to release him, of course. We replaced him with somebody else. And the next day, another prisoner broke down. So he became a model of how you get out of the prison because it was a prison run by psychologists. It was an amazing Kafka Pirandello-esque transformation. It was a prison run by psychologists, no longer an experiment, not only in the minds of the prisoners, but also me and my staff two graduate students and undergraduates. We had to end the study, which was supposed to go for two weeks after 36 hours, because five students, chosen because they were normal, healthy, on all personality tests and in all of our interviews, had emotional breakdowns. It had spun out of control. All experiments are artificial, so you always want to know what are the real world parallels. So this is a picture of our guards taking prisoners to parole board, headed by a an ex-convict with secretaries and, you know, very realistic, with the bags over the heads, legs chained. And there's Abu Ghraib, bigger bags, bigger guns. I became an expert witness for one of the guards in Abu Ghraib because when the Bush administration and when the military general said, this is the work of a few bad apples, I said, you know, I don't believe that. I believe American soldiers are good, and somebody put them in a bad barrel just like I did at the Stanford Prison Study because the parallels, the visual parallels were dramatic. In fact, as an expert witness, I got to understand him. I got access to all the thousand of those ugly pictures of which we saw a dozen. And I got access to all the, the uh, reports. And there was no question, Abu Ghraib was a Stanford prison study on steroids. It was a corrupting situation created by the military that not only Chip Frederick, the guy I defended, but all the other soldiers on the night shift were, were subjected to. Of course he's guilty. You are accountable for your behavior. When nine of nine people on the night shift did similarly bad things, and they were, all, they were not real soldiers, they were military, police, army, reserve, and no one on the day shift did anything bad, I say, what is the difference? On the night shift, this military intelligence tells military police, we want you guys to take the gloves off. We want you to do whatever you have to do so when we interrogate them, they're going to spill the beans. And then in three months, not a senior officer goes down to the dungeon to, to see what they're doing. 
The day shift is always surveillance. So here's a situational difference which produces the horrific behavior we saw of American men and women not only abusing prisoners, but smiling, giving high fives. So why do ordinary people turn evil? We have a recipe. We know in a very short time that we put you in a new situation, especially one where we can manipulate whether you have a lot of power or none. And here's 10 variables that can get the majority of people in any situation to do almost anything that we would all agree is evil. But now we want to turn, flip the table. We want to know what's involved in getting people to become heroic. And there's a whole list of possibilities, including mindfulness, compassion, empathy. We don't have a clue. There's almost no research on heroism. It's an incredible phenomenon. The word does not exist in psychology texts. It doesn't exist in positive psychologies uh, human strengths and virtues, because uh, heroism is an action, it's not a virtue, according to them. I recently had a dialogue with the Dalai Lama at Stanford, and I said, is, it, is compassion enough in a world filled with evil? Doesn't compassion have to be socially engaged? Doesn't compassion have to lead to heroic action? And he reluctantly agreed, because he still thinks, you know, once everybody in the world is compassionate, evil will cease to exist, but that, for me, is a fantasy. And so I'm waiting for that. We want to create heroes. So he heroism is a behavior that is voluntarily, uh, it's coming to the aid of others in need, uh, or in defense of a moral principle or an ethical cause, uh, and involves a risk, a risk to have life and limb, a risk to your career. And that's altruism is heroism light, no real risk. And you can't do it expecting reward. You can get a reward afterwards, but that can't be the motivation. The other thing is, we believe heroism is coachable, trainable, modeled, and not inborn. So what does it take to be a hero? We used to think that heroes were special people. And this really comes from Joseph Campbell and others, for whom hero, heroes were male warriors, Achilles, Agamemnon, Odysseus. Uh, and it turns out, no. Most heroes are ordinary people. It's the act of heroism that transcends them into some, something special and ordinary, uh, not ordinary. So one of, people, one of the people on my team interviewed President Obama uh, to say, what does it take to be a hero? Do you have to be a special person? And he is the really eloquent, concise uh, statement that, that Obama makes. You know, uh, what's remarkable about uh, history is ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, you know, last year Rosa Parks passed away. Uh, and yeah, I, I remember sitting on this stage with world leaders and Bill they Clinton didn't and put senators and governors and thing. thinking uh, we were all paying homage to a seamstress uh, who had transformed the country and, and helped transform the world. Uh, you know, we, we, we never know sort of how our actions are going to ripple uh, over time. Uh, but each of us can take some responsibility for making sure that uh, we are pushing a little bit in the direction of justice and in the direction of equality and the direction of tolerance. And uh, when we do that, uh, uh, we may surprise ourselves with the amount of influence that, in fact, we have just by standing up or speaking out. Standing up, standing up, speaking out, and be aware that the power, we have a powerful influence. When you do something positive, without your awareness, people notice and you become a model for good things. When you do something bad, you become a model for, for the negative. So here's Rosa Parks, first lady of civil rights. Uh, here's Rosa Parks as a prisoner. Because she refused to give up her seat, she is 7053, uh, sent to jail in 1955. And people said, did you not get up because you were tired? She said, no, no, the only tired I was, I was tired of giving in, giving into racism, giving into the system. Here's the guy who stopped Abu Ghraib, Joe Darby, the most ordinary guy in the world, a low-level private. He did the right thing. He took the CD that his friends showed him with these hundreds of pictures, and he brought it to a senior investigating officer and said, sir, you have to stop this. He did it knowing he was going to get in trouble because his buddies were all going to get uh, dishonorably discharged. Here's a little kid. Heroes come in all sizes. Nine-year-old Lin Howe. There was an earthquake just before the Olympics, uh, and the school collapsed. He, was, he survived, he's running out, and he notices two of his buddies trying to escape. He runs over, helps them get out. People said, why did you risk your life? He said, why? I was the whole monitor. It was my job <laughs> to look after my classmates. So this is what I call putting the heroic imagination into action. And it's what we are proposing. 
And Cuba, uh, we have the, the communal heroes in Cuba uh, uh, that, that we all saw. Uh, some of this stimulated by Václav Havel's dramatic uh, heroism in the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, Libya's political, political unrest was uh, produced by a single lawyer. And we know now in Japan, 50 engineers are sacrificing their life to stay on duty all this time to try to stop uh, the uh, nuclear meltdown. The question is, what can you do? When one person stops to help in an emergency, many others join in. When there's, the bystander effect is, when there's a, a, a number of people, the more people who are less likely anybody's to help. But when the first person helps, immediately there's a crowd. So what do you do? Be that person. That's the power of one. Be that first person. Because when you do, suddenly everybody, all the other citizens join you. Uh, they are to be different. Because what, it, what that means is, in any situation, the group says, don't get involved, mind your own business. You cannot be a hero unless you're willing to be different, different from the others. Uh, flex your moral courage. Act wisely, well, and often. Practice being a hero. Be an ally. Be an ally, we tell, this is, I'm gonna we talk to high school kids tomorrow. Uh, be an ally to gay, lesbian, shy kids. Those are the ones that are gonna get uh, uh, bullied the most. Stand up for them. Simply, that's the power of two. Start with small steps, everyday deeds. Focus on others. Give a compliment a day. Ask questions, don't blindly obey. Have courageous conversations before situ the situation gets out of control. And discover, what is your ripple effect? What action or inaction, whether you act or don't, it doesn't really matter because you have a ripple effect, again, positive or negative. So Superman's father is telling Superman, flying around all day just won't cut it. Sooner or later, you're going to have to take some action. And my heroic imagination project is providing the toolkits uh, so that they can be wise and effective heroes. So the heroic imagination is uh, learning to be courageous. Uh, imagination is teaching people to imagine themselves acting heroically in everyday situations. And heroic imagination is a mindset that enhances people's effectiveness as becoming social change agents. So the four domains of my heroic imagination project are education. We have programs in uh, high school, middle school, and now college. We want to have these in summer camps and clubs and online and ultimately mobile apps. We, we are doing research and we want to get funding so we can sponsor research for graduate students everywhere. We have a wonderful corporate program creating cultures of integrity, heroic leadership, and internal whistleblowing. And we'd love to do our magic in your company. We just finished a pilot at Google. And lastly, we want to have a public engagement website where we can send our message around the world in, with interactive exercises. So the world needs more heroes. What the world really needs is you. Because Yoda tells us, do or do not, there is no try. And heroes don't try, they just do. Thank you very much.